Need more energy throughout the day? Looking for a kick to your workout? RockinThatIDLife.com has you covered with delicious flavors you've grown to love in tropical fruit and mixed berry, but now fall in love with the new fruit punch and orange flavors. Try them all at RockinThatIDLife.com. Realtor Mike Burgoyne with Real Brokerage LLC makes the moving process easier. Work with a realtor who plays and studies the game and will work as hard as the boys on the ice to get you the best deal. Check out Mike on the web at strikewithmike.com and jumpstart your move today. That's strikewithmike.com. This is Let's Go Blues Radio starring Jeff Ponder and two other guys. What is the worst goal you feel like you have ever given up in your career? Oh, I got to pick just one. There's so uh, <laughs> just one. How about, okay, let me, let me. Uh... Cheap, lying, no good, rotten, four flushing, low life, snake licking, dirt eating, inbred, <laughs> overstuffed, ignorant, blood sucking, dog kissing. Brainless, amazing how in the morning I'd wake up and I couldn't find my toothbrush and then I realized it was floating in the back of the toilet and then I put one and one together and I knew who did it. <laughs> I was Gilmore. When a guy misses a slap shot, the first thing he does is look at his stick. <laughs> yeah, we do. It really has nothing to do with the stick. Now the girls won't do that. The girls will internalize. They'll blame themselves when there's a mistake. Well, guys have Jokin it came down from, from uh, I believe it was the LA Kings we were affiliated with at the time. And the guy just had just a just a rotten attitude. Never thought highly of him, uh, you know, from that standpoint. So yeah. Well, summertime. It is the third episode of the Let's Go Blues Radio Summer Series. I'm your host, Jeff Ponder. Thanks for tuning in this week as we are again talking about the future of the St. Louis Blues. Support for Let's Go Blues Radio is brought to you in part by RockinThenIDLife.com, where we help you make every workout, every meal count, do life better. And by Mike Burgoyne of Real Brokerage Realty. Use StrikeWithMike.com to search properties in your area and to contact Mike, who will help put you in your dream home or sell your current home. And by Center Ice Brewery, which serves St. Louis with flavorful hockey-themed beer, Find your new favorite brew at local grocery stores and liquor stores throughout the St. Louis area. This is franchise episode number 412 all time, and this is season 12, episode 3. Uh, well, we've got a special guest and a friend of the show in Mike Morial of NHL.com to talk about who the Blues may be targeting in the upcoming draft now that we know where they'll be drafting. Uh, but first, let's talk about... Uh, the ever popular NHL draft lottery. Uh, so, uh, in case you missed the show, uh, the Blues did stand pat at number 10, so they will be picking there with their first pick, and that is the Blues pick, uh, their actual pick. Uh, still awaiting, well, as of the recording of this, uh, seeing where Dallas and Toronto will finish to see where their other two picks will be. Um, but it's looking like uh, they are going to be out in the second round. Uh, well, maybe not Dallas, but definitely Toronto, uh, unless they can overcome some craziness. Uh, but, uh, and, and, okay, so number 10, that's great. We'll talk about that more here with Mike in a minute. Um, but the big news out of the NHL draft lottery, and it does affect the St. Louis Blues, and it's the shocker of the century uh, as the pick goes to the uh, – so the Columbus Blue Jackets, they wish the Chicago Blackhawks uh, got the number one pick. And I say it's a shocker of the century because that was the speculation from everyone. If this is rigged, it's going to go to Chicago. And uh, it, clearly uh, it, they did. They got the pick, even though they had the third best odds at 11.5%. Anaheim and Columbus both had better odds, but they fell. Um, and, uh, this was again, no, it was, it was of no surprise to anyone. And it, it's not just the rig thing. It's the, it's the, of all the teams, anybody wants to see Connor Bedard go to it's the Chicago Blackhawks are up there as a team that nobody wanted, um, except for Chicago fans, obviously. Um, and, uh, you know, if you follow me on Twitter, you saw me kind of lose it. Uh, with this pick just because the draft coverage was bad. Um, uh, Kevin Weeks had a slip up that 
made it. I mean, you want to talk about is this thing rigged? Well, you have a major slip up where you basically announced that there was somebody who fell in the draft like Columbus uh, before you even announce the pick itself. Uh, such a lapse in coverage. Uh, do better ESPN and NHL. That was just you can't have that. Um, but, uh, and, and listen, I don't want to get too much into the weeds here. We've talked about situations involving the Blackhawks the last couple, uh, years on this show. So I'm not going to get too deep into that. All I'm going to say is they should not have had a first round pick in my opinion this year, maybe last year, maybe next year, there should have been something, uh, with the Brad Aldrich situation they forfeited $2 million, which they've already made that up. They've already got, I think I saw um, as of Tuesday morning, uh, they'd already had $2.5 million in new season ticket holder uh, uh, people wanting to come see Connor Bedard. So they've already, that that's a drop in the bucket for the Chicago Blackhawks. Uh, Arizona held pre, pre-draft workouts, um, which they have, they said they were unaware that they broke any rules. They lost a first round pick. New Jersey signed Ilya Kovalchuk to a contract that they deemed was was not legal at the time. Uh, they lost a first round pick. Uh, let's not forget that in 1999, the St. Louis Blues were forced to send uh, the New Jersey Devils 1.4 million dollars in the Devils' choice of one first round pick in the next five years because of tampering with Scott Stevens five years earlier in 1994. Uh, he was offer sheeted by Jack Quinn, who was no longer with the organization. Uh, but the Chicago Blackhawks, they cover up sexual abuse throughout the entire organization, not just a couple people, not just one person, uh, but they end up with Connor Bedard. Uh, sexual abuse? Nah, we don't punish that. Um, it, that's all I'll say about it. Uh, it's just uh, you expect more from the NHL. More should have been done. And, you know, if you want to say, well, those people were fired, they were all let go, the Joel Quinvilles, even if you want to say the Patrick Canes and Jonathan Taves, they're gone to the Duncan Keiths. Uh, but still, again, the precedence was already set under Gary Bettman's watch with the Blues. That's why I brought up the, the 1999 thing with the Devils. Um, Jack Quinn, he was, the, he was the man who did that. He was not with the organization when they – Passed this judgment, yet the Blues still had to pay uh, with a draft pick and with money. So, um, again, precedence was set. Nothing happened. Um, very disappointed in the NHL on that. Something more should have been done. Uh, guest today, Mike Morial, a writer over at NHL.com and a host of the NHL Draft Class podcast. He's going to talk with us today about uh, who the Blues could take at number 10, uh, or even with their later first round picks that they have from again from well the, the Rangers trade, but Dallas's pick and uh, of course the Toronto pick as well. Uh, we talk about Connor Bedard, Adam Fantilli. Are they as good as we're hearing? Yes, <laughs> the answer is yes. But here in more detail, uh, what Mike has to think of those players as well as many other. I mean this this stacked. Uh, first round that, that we keep hearing about. Actually, just the whole draft itself is stacked. Um, this is all stuff that, that we talk about in detail here. So you're in for a fun one if you're interested in the upcoming NHL draft. Uh, reminder, we have our votes going right now for the Blues' all-time team. Uh, you can vote on our polls over on our Twitter page at LGB Radio. Uh, currently running, if you're listening to this on, well, at premiere Wednesday night, podcast Thursday, Friday, whatever. Uh, we run these polls for a week. Um, running right now is the second vote for right-handed defenseman. That is Alex Petrangelo, Jeff Brown, and Kevin Shattenkirk. So go over to our Twitter page, make your pick for what you think is the uh, uh, should be the winner, um, at least of those three. Uh, remember to comment on the Twitter poll as well for a chance to win a prize. We've had a few but not nearly as much as I thought we would. Uh, People, I'm giving away stuff, and it's cool stuff. I've got – I haven't announced them yet. I'm going to next week, a couple of them at least. I've got at least one signed puck. I've got uh, some really cool blues giveaways from the past that you've probably forgotten about. These are cool prizes, and I'm just surprised we're not – and maybe it's because I haven't revealed what they are. 
Uh, so if you want to win a prize, get on over there. Comment on the Twitter poll. And again, if you're not on Twitter, uh, go over to the Facebook page. Let's go Blues Radio. And you can comment there as well. Um, we post a, 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 a link to each Twitter poll over on Facebook as well. So if you comment there, those also count. Um, so again, we've got a great guest coming up here, uh, Mike Morial, a friend of the show, someone we had on last week. So he returns. He's a two-time two-time friend of the show with Let's Go Blues Radio. And we'll get to him uh, right after this break and, uh, and hear from our awesome sponsors with Let's Go Blues Radio. We'll return after these messages. Every beer league hockey night, I grab my hockey bag and sticks and throw them in the trunk of my car. And the very next thing I do, I mix up a boost of energy courtesy of RockinThatIDLife.com. It's formulated to break up its delivery in three ways, which helps me get through all three periods of hockey. Phase one provides a rapid onset of energy, concentration, alertness, and motivation. By period two, I'm receiving a dose of sustained energy, increased focus, metabolism, cognitive function, performance, and feelings of well-being which i need with the way i play in phase three i'm getting fatigue protection without jitters and crash an elevated mood and a reduction of fluid retention to help me make the big play when it counts this same triphasic approach helps me when i drink it during work hours or simply just for a pick-me-up when i need it try one of the four energy flavors by visiting rockinthatidlife.com but make sure to email dustin at rockinthatidlife at gmail.com and tell him let's go blues radio sent you to receive an additional 10 percent off your order that's rockinthatidlife.com centerized brewery is a beer lover's dream for hockey fans Based in St. Louis, Missouri, owner Steve Albers has been brewing hockey-themed favorites for thirsty sports fans since 2017. From the Beauty IPA to the Old Arena Lager, a cold, frosty, hockey-themed beer is just what the doctor ordered for hockey fans in St. Louis. Make sure to check your local beer store for Center Ice Brewery beer today. LGB. Let's go beer. During the magical 2019 playoff run, I was in the midst of buying my current home. Every time I spoke with my realtor, obviously, home buying was the discussion. But in the back of my mind, I couldn't stop thinking about what was destined to happen for our St. Louis hockey team. If only there were a realtor who could have walked me through the process, held my hand when needed, but was there to be a sounding board when I wanted to complain about a certain hand pass goal. Let realtor Mike Burgoyne with Real Brokerage be that for you. He'll have your needs top of mind as he skates you through the home buying or selling process, dangling you past any obstacles and assisting on all your home goals. Check out strikewithmike.com for more information or give him a call directly at 314-753-4060. That's Mike Burgoyne with Real Brokerage at strikewithmike.com and that number again is 314-753-4060. Don't forget to tell Mike that Let's Go Blues Radio sent you. And now, back to Let's Go Blues Radio, the longest running St. Louis Blues podcast with Price, Ponder, and Day. And welcome back from break. Right now, we're joined by Mike Morial of NHL.com. He's a staff writer over there, co-host of the NHL Draft Class podcast, actually already a friend of the show. We had him on last year, if you remember, so he is rejoining us to talk about his uh, well, his work with the NHL and with uh, the upcoming draft. He's a very big prospect guru. Also, as we mentioned last year, New Jersey High School Ice Hockey Hall of Fame member, of course. Can't forget that. Mike, thanks for joining us. Thanks a lot, Jeff. What an introduction. I appreciate that. And yes, you were you were one of the one of the few that actually mentioned uh, the high school work that I was able to do. That actually uh, I was able to get the jump start there covering the high school game in New Jersey, which was fantastic. The Kyle Palmieri's, the James Van Reems Dykes. Uh, uh, you know, it was just amazing to, to see high school hockey grow and flourish in the Gordon State, to be a part of it. And um, it led me to where I am today. So I'm very grateful for, for, for high school hockey. So uh, I'm not poking fun, but we can hear a bit of an accent. So <laughs> are you a New Jersey native as, as well? I, I am. Uh, I am a New Jersey native. Uh, I've always been in, in northern New Jersey uh, for the most part. Uh, 
born and, and raised. I uh, went to school there. Um, and uh, I went to I went to college uh, in the southern part of New Jersey at Ryder University in Lawrenceville. Um, so it was all good. Uh, and, and you are certainly not the first to recognize that accent. Uh, <laughs> you know, I get uh, I get hit with that on numerous occasions, you know, get me a cup of coffee and uh, all kinds of things. So it's all it's always fun. And I'm I'm, I'm right there with it. I, you know, hey, I'm proud of my accent. What can I say, Jeff? <laughs> oh, I'm with you. I'm, that's what we say here in St. Louis. You know, people give us trouble, you know, all oh, St. Louis Midwest, you know, no, I'm proud to be from St. Louis. I love where I'm from. And I'll tell you, I've been to New Jersey. I've been all over New Jersey, honestly. Beautiful part of the country uh, that there's a reason they call it the Garden State. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, you know, I you know, I was fortunate with my, my grandparents. They lived in, down the uh, Jersey Shore. We had a big garden, uh, all kinds of things. We worked day, you know, during the day. Uh, uh, at night, we, we sold some of the vegetables uh, with our own little stand in front of the house. Um, it was a labor of love as, as young kids. Uh, and then we were rewarded by going to one of the lakes in uh, a nearby town. Uh, in South Jersey and Lakehurst or Orchard River or wherever it might be, which was which was outstanding. So fun times, memorable days, uh, you know, those summers uh, on the Jersey Shore. So um, but, yeah, uh, there's a lot to like about the Garden State. Uh, and I'm glad you I'm glad you, you think so, Jeff. I'm glad you think so. Oh, yeah. I, I visited a bunch of the rinks out there as well. Uh, some really nice facilities out there. I'm trying to Drawn a blank on the one that uh, I visited a lot, but uh, what what uh, what rink are you at a lot? I mean, I know that uh, clearly you're covering the Devils, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, their current run, but in terms of uh, you know maybe not NHL rinks, where's one that you're at a lot there in New Jersey? Yeah, well, I mean, several of the rinks when I covered the, it's it's funny because um, a lot of the high school rinks in New Jersey when I covered the high school game, um, there weren't there there weren't a lot of them, and I think. That's what made it difficult for high school teams to field those hockey programs. But now, you know, I've been out of the loop for high school hockey a little bit since I joined NHL.com in, in 2008. But now I'm hearing that, you know, it's it's doubled the amount of rinks in New Jersey since I, since I've stopped covering the, the high school game, which is fantastic because you see more and more teams coming in. Uh, and joining the ranks because there are more arenas, there are more ice surfaces in those arenas, usually two to three in each arena. Um, you know, I go to Menon Arena a lot when I was, uh, I, and I still do, uh, a lot of the Morris County teams there, the Del Bartons, which is usually a powerhouse, um, you know, uh, Cody Arena in West Orange, which actually was where the Devils used to practice before they uh, built the Prudential Center, which now has a practice facility attached to the main rink. So there's no need for the Devils to even leave the uh, the area there in Newark. They can just practice and then just go to the main rink. But Cody Arena, which was originally called South Mountain Arena, used to uh, be the practice facility for the Devils. That's back in the in the you know the 90s and the early 2000s when the Devils were winning their cups with the Danicos and the uh, you know, uh, the Scott Stevens and those players, Patrick Eliash, they were practicing over there. So that was another arena I went to regularly because a lot of the championships, high school championships were held there. And we were very fortunate, Jeff, uh, that uh, Lou Lamorello, who was general manager of the Devils at the time when I was covering high school hockey, uh, wanted the high school championships to be played in the arena. And at that time, it was Continental Airlines Arena in East Rutherford, New Jersey. Um, and that was way back in, in, I want to say 85, 86, they, they started having the high school games there at, at Continental. And it was a great thrill for the high school players to experience what it was like to get dressed in a high school locker room, to play on that ice surface, to hear your name over the school board, just the overall atmosphere when the bus comes in and drives, you know, close to the Zamboni uh, entrance where the players get out, just that feeling of being a professional really stood out for the player. And and a lot of these kids, and you know, Jeff, it's like for a lot of these kids, this is a once in a lifetime experience because the majority of them, particularly those, you know, coming up through the ranks in New Jersey, aren't going to be playing professional hockey. This is it for them. They'll play four years of high school hockey. They'll experience it. They'll be with their friends. They'll have uh, some great memories to share later in life. But uh, this is it for them. So to experience that, the thrill of it, the luncheon that they had that Lou always uh, hosted for the four finalists uh, 
that were in the championship round um, was always a thrill for them. Lou used to uh, talk and uh, the coaches used to speak. So it was always a thrill. So, you know, I'm glad to see there are more and more rinks uh, popping up in New Jersey. Of course, I spend most of my time at Prudential Center covering the Devils. But every so often, you know, I'm treated to maybe a high school game or, or uh, you know, seeing a girls game for that matter, too. Girls hockey has really grown in New Jersey as well uh, at, at one of the local rinks, which is always fun. Uh, Bridgewater was the one I was trying to think Bridgewater of. Sports Arena, yes. Yep. I was Spent there a lot of times. time at, yes. at Bridgewater. That's a great arena, great yes. facility, and a, gr- and a beautiful part of New Jersey as well. Yes. Um, but, yeah, so, uh, you, again, we, we're you're talking about a little bit of uh, before we get to talking about some of the prospects coming up in this upcoming draft. I did want to ask you, because you are covering New Jersey right now, the Devils, for the uh, Stanley Cup playoffs for NHL.com. Um, you know, clearly we know how the series is going. It's been a fun uh, playoff run for them. Uh, but in terms of just covering, because, you know, again, you, you do a lot of coverage for the draft uh, for upcoming players. But now you're seeing these NHL players all the time. Clearly, you've been with NHL.com since 2008. Who's someone right now that you're covering that, that you love just, and, and maybe not even because of a personal level, but somebody that you're covering right now for the Devils who's just, you love watching play and you just, you, you kind of, you know, because again, I used to be in the media. I get it. Partially, you're like, I can't root for these guys, but I'm rooting for that guy because he's a great guy and he's a great skater and a great whatever. Uh, who is that for you right now? It's funny you say that too, Jeff, real quick, because, you know, you have a favorite team growing up as a kid, right? And then when you're in the business, in the field, and in my case, working for dot com, so I'm covering basically all 32 teams, you become a fan of every team. There's something about every team that really piques your interest, right? That really intrigues you about the team, whether it be a player, whether it be something the coach said, uh, whatever it may be. So there's always that interest. And I, I enjoy watching all 32 teams. And I do have likes uh, about every one of the teams but as in terms of the devils there are two players that came to mind right away when you know you were talking there and 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 that was nico he and, and jack hughes um both those players you know i covered extensively prior to their draft year so they knew me pretty well uh entering the draft and and now when i enter the devil's locker room they know me like it's funny, like Nico Heeshear, every so often, if if there's not a lot of people entering after a morning skate or if it's quiet after a off day practice, like Nico will hold out his fist for a fist bump when he sees me and say, hey, how's it going? We'll talk about life. We'll talk about family. And, and Jack's the same way. In fact, Jack, just yesterday when I was at uh, uh, the practice for the Devils, there was no one around Jack's locker, which is unusual. Usually there's a huge crowd, but on game days there is, and there, there was a big crowd around his locker stall this morning. But yesterday during the off day, they left Jack alone. So I was just walking around and I happened to walk by his locker and he said, hey, what do you think about the lottery? Who's going to win the lottery? You know, who's going to be, you know, the second overall pick? We know about the first overall pick. So it's just things like that, that, you know, for me personally, it's 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 a lot of fun, right? Because you've covered these guys, you know what they're like off the ice, they're personable. And then when you get them in the interviews with with in media scrums, whether you know the Canadian media is coming up for a day, it, you know they have to be put on that business like persona to make sure they sound professional. But really, you know, they're still kids, right, Jeff? They're still kids. They're twenty year old kids that are just playing the game they love and. I really appreciate that, and 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 it's just it's just a cool it's just a cool cool experience. Uh, um, now that I've been at dot com for you know over fourteen fifteen years now, it's just a lot of fun seeing the players that I cover um, in a draft eligible season just grow and grow and grow to become these elite uh, elite level players, elite level um, guys that are now winning awards. And let's face it, I, I know Jack's up. Uh, for the Lady Bing for the Sportsmanship Trophy this year, one of the finalists. And, and Nico Heischer is up for one of the most prestigious uh, NHL awards, which is the Selkie. Um, so both those players, I'm proud of them and what they've accomplished. And uh, I'm proud to say that I, you know, I know them not only on the ice, but off the ice as well. Yeah, I, I've, I, again, similar situation uh, with uh, Ian Cole, uh, current mm-hmm. NHL player, when he was drafted by the Blues. He spent a lot of time in the Peoria Riverman organization, which is about a two hour drive here from St. Louis. And I went and covered him a couple times up in Peoria, you know, getting prospect looks and that kind of thing. And there was a couple times where when he first joined the Blues, 
I would ask him, you know, I'd ask our, uh, the media relations coordinator for the Blues, Dan O'Neill, can you get Ian Cole for me? Yeah, no problem. So I did that like two or three times. And then like the fourth game I was at, he was at, I didn't, I didn't do it. He comes out and he goes, what, you don't want to interview me today? And I'm like, <laughs> I mean, I guess I can. And so I interviewed him. And so every time after that, for about the next six or seven games I was at, I had to ask the media relations coordinator, Dan O'Neill, hey, man, can you go get Ian Cole for me? And he finally just <laughs> rolls his eyes. And he's like, am I going to have to do this every game? And I'm like, mm. as long as he's a blue, yes, I think you're going to have to. <laughs> good stuff. So, That's good stuff. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's just you love the personality in some of these guys. You know, I, I, I've told stories on the show about – David Backus, Ryan Reeves, like mm. when you get to actually know these guys and know the people they are, you can't help but root for them just a little bit. Yeah, real quick too, uh, on that top, like when I covered high school hockey in Jersey, uh, James Van Riemsdyk was an up and coming kid. He played for Christian Brothers Academy, which is usually a powerhouse. They play at the Wall Ice Arena in Middletown, New Jersey. So I, I was watching him when he came in as a freshman, real, you know, uh, very didn't want to talk to the media was very shy but boy when he, when he got on the ice he was like an animal he was a beast one of the best players out there um and I covered him his first two years covered him a little bit at the NCTP uh, and when he was drafted and started playing in the in the National Hockey League when I entered the locker room and he was there uh with the Flyers he would call me uh Mr. Moriel and I went over to him I says JVR, you're well beyond that now. You don't need to call me Mr. Moriano. Just call me Mike. That's fine. You know, I, I don't want to be, you know, that old veteran sport, you know, nagging sports writer. Just call me Mike and let's call it a day. So he calls me Mike now. Yeah, yeah. Good. I'm glad he does now, finally. Yeah. <laughs> NHL yeah. veteran for 15 years. He's finally calling you Mike. That's it. <laughs> good stuff. It's good stuff. Uh, so, so speaking of some of these prospects coming up, um, obviously there's – there's a couple names that we've all heard thrown around. And, and, but before we get to that, I wanted to ask you in general, the talk has been, this is a very deep draft, a very deep draft. The blues have three picks talking about the team here uh, in this first round. I mean, comparatively speaking to other rounds and I'm not asking for specific years or specific players picked, but just kind of in, in recent memory, um, how deep is this draft comparatively speaking? Yeah, this, this 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 draft is very deep, Jeff. Yeah, every year I'm probably going to tell you that there's some depth to the draft, and again, there is depth and and there's quality. But I think one thing that sticks out this year for me is the skill component. There's a lot of high end skill players available in this draft class, and, and that's one thing uh, to me that really sticks out: high caliber forwards. There 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 are quite a few centermen um, in the, in this draft class, and you know, not only Bedard at the top, but there's quite a few centermen that uh, have really made a name for themselves, um, you know, over the second half of this particular season. Um, defensively, it might not be the type of year that we're accustomed to. Um, there, there are a few big names uh, on the defensive side of things, um, and we'll probably get into those. But uh, for the most part, forward-wise, I think every team that has a, has a pick in the first round is going to get someone that potentially um, could play a huge role in, if not a top six, certainly a top nine role. Um, uh, we got, like I said, the skill is there. A lot of 200-foot players that get the job done. And a lot of the players in this draft class as well, Jeff, I must say, you know, represented their countries at the World Junior Championships and, and really played exceptionally well. Usually when you're an, you know, an underage player on those teams, and look, we all know that's a 19-year-old tournament. Um, and this year it was held in, in Nova Scotia, and it was fantastic. But there were several players, including a lot of goaltenders uh, in that tournament that really stood out to me and, and have a, you know, a really legitimate chance of not only um, being selected early in this draft, but making an impact, if not uh, in two years, certainly uh, three, four years down the road. So uh, we can't talk about this draft class without first mentioning um, the projected number one pick in Connor Bedard. Um, last year we saw Shane Wright was the name that I remember you and I discussed a lot, and he ended up dropping pretty yeah. far. I think it was number four. Yeah. Um, and uh, and we saw uh, uh, Slavkowski take uh, the first spot with Montreal. First of all, that's not happening this year, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Connor Bedard is going to be a Chicago Blackhawk. Yeah, the most gifted NHL draft prospect we have seen 
in in six years since since Austin Matthews in 2016. Obviously, everyone talks about Connor McDavid in 2015 too. If you want to go back that that far, um, I don't see any reason why you couldn't. Um, he's generational because to me, he's more than just a franchise changing player. Um, I, I went to Regina, Jeff, uh, for a weekend uh, of games uh, in March and sat down with, with Bedard uh, in the stands uh, at Brandt Center. Uh, the thing that really, look, we know the kid is, is full of talent. You can see it. It's, it's obvious. The shot is unreal. His skating is sensational. Um, and he comes, at, he comes at you east-west where McDavid, when you watch McDavid skate and is looking to push the pace, McDavid is more that north-south type of guy, power in the legs. He's going to drive you back, whereas Bedard is more the guy that he's looking to catch defensemen leaning one way. When he gets them leaning one way by going east or west, he's going to shoot the opposite direction. He has the speed to do it, pass, and then go north-south. So it's just a little tweak in styles with the skating that I see, Um, but so dynamic, the smarts, the IQ, you know, out of this world. And to think that the ceiling is still high for Connor Bedard. He hasn't reached the pinnacle of play, his NHL, uh, you know, performance yet. So we'll see him in the NHL next year for sure. I'm sure he'll have a, a real, real solid season, despite the fact that might not be a lot of people around him. But the one thing I want to say about Bedard real quick is his his off the ice. And the one thing I know, you know, on the ESPN production uh, last night prior to the lottery, Kevin Weeks had a little bit uh, an interview with, with Bedard. And the thing that struck me uh, about that interview was when when Weeks, he asked uh, Bedard about, you know, some of the players that he grew up idolizing or, you know, wanting to emulate now as a player. And he mentioned Sidney Crosby. Now, we all know, yes, you know, a lot of young players want to emulate and model Sidney Crosby. But the thing that struck me, and this is what I see in Bedard when we sat down and we spoke as well, was the fact that he talked about his off-the-ice demeanor. It wasn't just the skill on the ice and what Crosby can bring as a 200-foot player. It was more um, what he did for the community, how he is with fans, how he signs autographs, how he's always there to take pictures and and be with the fans because they're the ones that make it possible for him uh, to play the game he enjoys uh, and and to relish those opportunities. So he just gets it, right, Jay? He gets it, and it's unlike – I got to say, it's unlike any prospect that I've ever covered since I've been at .com because of that thinking that he has, that mentality off the ice, his demeanor off the ice. When I sat down with him – he actually, before we started the interview, he said, so how's everything going for you here in Regina? Are you comfortable? Can I make any suggestions on where to go to eat? Like, who does, wow. what 17-year-old does that, right? <laughs> in an interview, you know this, Jeff. It's like, I was like blown away um, just by the fact that here's a 17-year-old kid asking me, you know, how can I make you more comfortable? Where I'm kind of worried about, you know, oh, is he kind of intimidated that I'm going to ask him a question that he can't answer? But he was, you know, 100%. He was all good with everything I asked, whether it was a question that might have been controversial, whether it was a question that was a, a softball. It didn't matter. He answered the same way. He didn't give you the robotic stuff. Um, it's all coming from the heart and things he says. And he is a true team player. He'll always talk about his teammates. He'll always give you more about his teammates than when you ask him, for stuff about himself, his best assets, or what he feels he's good at. Those will be the short answers. The longer answers, if you ask him about teammates and other players that he's played against, that's when he'll give you the big, long responses. So just an, a phenomenal kid, Jeff. And the, I tell you, the Chicago Blackhawks and their fans are, should be real fortunate that they're getting this kid because he's going to be dynamite. Everything that you just said is going to anger Blues fans even more because they're like, <laughs> dude, we have to hate this kid. Like, yeah, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So it, yeah. that that was the the conversation in St. Louis is is, oh, my God, of course, this kid's going to Chicago. You know, I, <laughs> and, you know, it, you think like Anaheim, Columbus. OK, we'll, we'll have to deal with that twice, three times a year. Chicago. No, you're going to see this kid plenty. And Blues and Blackhawks clearly in a bit of a rebuild right now. 
Chicago takes the step forward, and you mentioned it. They don't have a whole lot right now. They they had a lot of of they had a rough year last year. Let's say yeah. they got a ton of cap space. Uh, they could be. I'm not. I'm not saying they're gonna build up into a Stanley Cup player or a Stanley Cup uh, uh, favorite next year. But with Bedard, that definitely ups that rebuild pretty quickly for them. Yeah, it does. It does. It, but you know, the last time the last time the Blues, I think, picked inside the top ten of the draft, it, it might have been back in 2008. I'm just off the top of my head here. You know, when they That's took correct. Petrangelo, yep. uh, Petrangelo fourth overall. So, uh, you know, for me, Jeff and I, I respect what blues management has done here. They've taken a patient approach to prospect development over the past, you know, decade plus. Um, the players St. U- St. Louis usually drafts. Are, are, those are typical project type prospects. So from where they're drafting, you know, three, five years away from reaching the show. And they've focused primarily, you know, on forward depth and, and a lot of these drafts by picking up the likes of a Jimmy Snuggerud, uh, a Zachary, uh, Zachary Balduk and, and Jake neighbors who, um, you know, is on the cusp of some greatness here um, with three of its most recent first round choices. So um, I, I look, I, I like what the blues have done uh, in the past and I know it's unfortunate. Look, every, all other, the other 31 teams in the league are, are Kicking the sound, even the, even the teams in the playoffs are thinking to themselves, "Geez, you know this this Bedard." They're either saying, "Well, at least he's out of the conference." In the case of the Devils, right? They, we at least we don't have to deal with him in the Eastern Conference. And then for teams like you know the St. Louis Blues in the division, they're like, "Oh no, now we got to deal with this kid three four times uh, in the course of a regular season." But you do get to see him that many times a season, which is should be a special treat. Just as long, just as long as he doesn't, you know, pot a hat trick every time you, you know the, the Blues happen to play him. <laughs> That's what I say whenever uh, Connor McDavid and the Oilers come to town. Is I'm like, hey, you know what? There is a chance yes. the Blues get laughed out of the building, but you're seeing one of the greatest players of all time Absolutely. play the game. And and I and not say we don't want to project that onto Bedard. That's too soon for that. We hope he has a good NHL career, even though he's a Blackhawk. Um, <laughs> we do hope that for him as a, as a great young kid, as you've mentioned. But, yeah, I mean, there's something about, you know, going back to my younger days, seeing Wayne Gretzky play. I, I Quick story. I took my one of my favorite players of all time, Mario Lemieux. I tried to see him every time he came to St. Louis. There was hmm. illness. There was, uh, you know, the Hodgkin's lymphoma. I even went up to Chicago twice to try and see him play against the Blackhawks. Both games he missed. So I never mm. actually got to see Lemieux play. But seeing those great players play is just, it's a treat. It, whether Even if at the time you're just like, oh, that McDavid guy. Oh. But it's like you're seeing greatness play in front of your eyes. There's something Absolutely. special about that. Absolutely. It, uh, I, I I feel the same way. You, you, said, it, you said it wonderfully there. It, it's like... You know, when I growing up, growing up, I was I followed the Flyers uh, a lot. Uh, I, I, I and this was during the '80s when they had you know Pelly Lindbergh and David Poulin, Peter Zezel, uh, Ilke Sinisalo. So those were the teams that I liked. That Mike Keenan was the coach of that team. I just had a love for watching the Flyers, the way they played, the defensive approach they had, and their their offense. And and Davey Poulin was the captain. Now maybe Davey Poulin to some out there isn't the most, you know, I don't know, the, the all-star type player that you would expect. But to me, he was just because of the role he played with the Flyers during those days and just his mindset, demeanor, and the way he played the game. I just really respected and admired. So when I had a chance to, to, to see him, not only as a fan, but now, as, now that he's, uh, you know, an analyst, a hockey analyst, Jeff, I see him, you know, in the media room uh, every so often. So just a chance to go up to and, and talk to someone that, you know, he used to have a jersey of with his name on the back. Is there something special about that for sure? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, I've told this story on the show before, but the one time I walk, I, you know, you meet Al McKinnis, you know, in the Blues locker yeah. rooms, you know, you meet, <laughs> it, and, you know, there's a little bit of fanboy in you that's like, whoa. And, but then yes. you like kind of compose yourself. Okay. No big Enjoy. deal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Wayne Gretzky saw him in the hallway. We were turning; I was turning one corner, he was turning the other. He walked by me, and I'm just looking at him. I'm like, "Oh, it's Wayne Gretzky," and, <laughs> and he kind of looks at me. He's like, "Hey, man, how you doing?" And I'm like, 
uh, good. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> and it was just, he just kind of smiled and kept walking. And I thought he probably deals with that all the time. <laughs> yeah. And here's a quick story. Uh, a quick story too. 2008, uh, when I was just, a, uh, came aboard uh, for dot com, the all-star game was in Atlanta. At that time we had maybe a, uh, a crew of about six or seven full timers at the all-star game, just doing several different stories. So the editor comes up to me and says, look, we need you to do something. You know, Gordy Howe is here and he wants to uh, go to both locker rooms, East, West. And we need you to go with Gordy and just make sure he knows the names of the players that wow. or recognizes the players as you're going into the locker rooms. And I was like, are you kidding me? It's like, <laughs> I, like I, I had to pitch myself. So sure enough, you know, Gordy comes up, I, I shake his hand, you know, his hand just kind of envelopes my entire arm, Jeff. I, the, the guy was huge. Just what, just what you would think. Uh, uh, one of the strongest hockey players alive. Here he is. And, you know, it was fantastic. And and I still remember to this day going into uh, the Eastern Conference room and Alex Ovechkin was there. And I, I, you know, when we went in, he was taping his sticks. And I, I said to Gore, I says, there's uh, Ovechkin. And he's like, oh, he goes, I got to go over there and talk to him. So he goes over and they had a little conversation. But can you believe, like, just the opportunity and the, and the chance to to be with Gordie Howe, to talk shop, talk hockey, talk life was is a memory I'll I'll never forget. Never forget. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah, that kind of stuff you'll never forget. Um, you know, I've I, again I've had moments like that. We all have. You know, I I know yep. people who have been like I went to a store and I saw <laughs> David Backus and he talked to me for twenty minutes about hockey. You know, and it's like those little interactions, yes. even with just fans or just people who are in general it means the world to them and for these athletes to be able to do that and, and kind of recognize it and be like, people idolize me. Like I need to be able to be the person they want me to be and expect me to be. And, and just be able to see them live. That is just incredible. Good stuff. Yeah, yep. it was. Well, so speaking of these, these young impressionable kids, um, <laughs> you know, there's a couple other uh, people that are, are coming pretty high. They're going to be picked very high in this draft. Adam Fantilli is another one who's uh, from Michigan. He's a Hobie Baker winner. Um, thing I read about him is his speed and his wingspan are just such excellent aspects for him. Obviously a good puck handler as well. But what stands out to you mostly about him? And, and will we see him in the NHL next season? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Right now, there, there are rumors that he will, uh, you know, will look to maybe play in the NHL next year. Um, I, I know that a lot of the players coming from Michigan – have spent two seasons, including Luke Hughes, uh, who is now with the with the Devils in the playoffs and played his first game, game three, and probably will tonight uh, in game four. But uh, that that's still a it's still in the air whether he's going to be NHL ready. I guess will it'll be determined by the Anaheim Ducks and what they have in store for him. But look, Fantilli, about six two, one hundred ninety five pounds, won the Hobie Baker Award as a freshman this year, which is just ridiculous. Plays the power play, kills penalties, is out there for key faceoffs. His coach Brandon Narado with the Wolverines uh, put just put him in every situation, um, and he's he was their best he was their best player this year as a as a freshman, Jeff. And you know when I talked to Luke Hughes um, about him, what did he bring that maybe people didn't know? You know, Luke told me that it was his leadership. It was like. Guys just gravitated towards him in the locker room, on the ice, because he was able to do and put up the points. And not only that, he was just a force of uh, of nature out there. I, You know, if he wasn't playing in the NCAA this year, he would have probably gotten into maybe three or four fights um, if it were the Canadian Hockey League or some other league that he was playing in. Because every team, every college coach that was against Michigan this year had to devise some type of strategy to thwart um, Adam Fantilli. That's how good a player he was. And and here's another player, right? Goes to the World Juniors uh, with Bedard. And Canada, of course, won the gold medal uh, in January. But Fantilli had to take a back seat to Bedard. He played a middle six role on a wing. He wasn't even playing the position that he'd been playing all season in Michigan. But he took the role, you know, didn't care. He's playing a part of the team, being a good teammate. And after the World Juniors, after winning that gold medal, he came back and he says, you know, that did wonders for me. He says, at the time, I was ticked off. You know, I, I yeah, I do want to play, but I just 
played my game, did what I needed to do to help the team any way I could. Um, but it's nice to see, like, he did what he needed to do. He was a good teammate, but he still had that fire about him, right? That I can do more than this, but for the benefit of the team, I'm going to do it this way. And then when he came back to Michigan, second half of the season, it was lights out. And that's what kind of, you know, it, the sky was the limit for him, and he won the Hobie Baker, and deservedly so. He's well adapted because he's a good skater to the pace of play in, in the college game, had that major impact, and he's deadly in all, all areas of the ice and on special teams. So um, I think for Anaheim, you're looking at a, at an Adam Fantilli, I think they'd be very happy with that pick. Yeah, sounds like it. Uh, so again, many prospects that we could talk about here. We can go down a whole list of about 50, I'm sure, but uh, we'll keep it to talking about where the Blues are picking now at number 10. We'll see them. I don't think we'll see any trades with that pick, but you never know. But if they stand pat and pick at number 10, there are some names that have been thrown around that we might see picked around that time. Dalibor Dvorsky, Daniil Butte, uh, Gabrielle Perot. Uh, by the way, love Gabrielle Perot because his dad wore 94. So hmm. that's my favorite number. <laughs> so good for you, kid. Hopefully you're a blue. Uh, but who are you thinking the blues might be looking at with that number 10 pick? Yeah, you, you mentioned D- D- Dvorsky. That's a player from AIK and the Alvin Scon, and, and, and he's had a, a, a fantastic year. 6'1", 201, uh, 201, real good skater, great with the puck on his stick, has that ability to, to maintain possession, has real good vision, can win battles in the corner, um, shows great skill in tight places. Um, and he led Slovakia with, with 13 points in seven games at the U18 Worlds, which was fantastic. He's a... He's expected to become the fourth Slovakia-born player chosen in the first round of the draft in the past two years. And you mentioned earlier, Jeff, you know, Slavkovsky, number one last year, Simon Nemitz to the Devils, number two, and forward Philip Mesar to the Canadians at number 26 in, in the 22 draft. So like Dalavir Dvorsky, I think that'd be a great pick at number 10. Also, Nate Danielson, the center from the Brandon Wheat Kings, a talented two-way center, good scoring ability. Danielson really shot up Central Scouting's rankings uh, from the midterm to the final to get into that first round projection. He's one of the better, uh, better, uh, centermen, uh, uh, still on the board when you reach that nine, 10, 11, 12 area. So if he's there, I think it'd be a positive pick. Uh, you know, the blues have needs throughout their lineup. And obviously, like we mentioned earlier, they started restructuring, but especially up front and Danielson seems uh, like not only a good option, but a, but a, a solid stylistic type fit. Uh, of the players the Blues typically draft. And then I really like the the Edward uh, Chalet from Brno and, and the Czech Republic. Had a real good World Junior Championship, talented forward with great offensive instincts, can shoot and pass with real good accuracy, goes about 6'2", 174, so a good size forward there, has proven to be active in the offensive zone, presents a challenge for opposing defenders with that size and strength. Um, had six points in five games, uh, for Checky at the at the U18 World. So in big moments, big situations, he's a guy that really uh, picks up his pace and his play. So those are three players right there, Jeff, I think might be in that area for St. Louis. Um, and I think all three are solid choices. Like I said, forward-wise, this draft is very deep. It goes maybe, you know, I would say almost between 45 and 55 players deep where you're going to find a a decent player that's going to be on your roster in four to five years at least. So these three players here, you're looking at solid prospects with a little, um, you know, maturing, nurturing uh, development in their leagues. I think they will be solid guys uh, two, three years down the road. So you mentioned, obviously, the forward depth of this draft is ridiculous, but there are some defensemen that are that are sprinkled in that are going to be probably, I mean, we're not going to have an all forward first round that, that is, is to my knowledge, never happened. Never happened. Um, no. Yeah. But one, uh, one name that stood out to me as a possible pick and, and let's face it, the blues defense last year was pretty atrocious. They fired their defensive coach. They're looking to make some changes. And, and I think clearly at number 10, you're not expecting a player to step in and play, especially if it's a defenseman next season, But if they are drafting for need at this point, like, okay, it's between four guys, but we need a defenseman. The name that that I've seen pop up is Dmitry Simashev. 
defenseman from Russia, Yaroslav Jr. Uh, from what I've read, just a good positionally sound two-way defenseman. Uh, maybe not the greatest offensive uh, dynamic talent, but uh, great outlet pass, smooth skater. Uh, w- what are your thoughts on Simashev going into the draft? Yeah, has real good size, about 6'4", 198. A little bit of a project. I think uh, in two to three years, you'll see what you might be able to get. But um, I know he was number 19 on Central Scouting's uh, final rankings. Uh, so he is a projected maybe late first, uh, middle second, uh, possible early third round type pick. But yeah, certainly he's a player that's going to be on everyone's radar those players from Russia, and I think Matvey Michkov is in the same boat here, right, Jeff? Uh, uh, you're just not sure. Scouts haven't been able to really dive into what these guys have been about this year because of what's been going on in Russia, to put it bluntly. And mm-hmm. I, I think there are some question marks as to uh, what, how these players have been developing, how they've been maturing. So there's always that question mark. Um, but certainly – you know, Simashev has, has really shown what he's capable of doing. You mentioned a lot of the qualities he has there, has a real good shot, has that size. He puts it to good use um, and certainly is a good skater for a player of his size. So um, he played 33 games this year in Russia's junior league. So, um, you know, certainly with a little more maturing, maybe playing in the KHL for a season or two, um, that development will help him uh, maybe speed up the process a little bit. That's what we expect him to do. He'll probably play some international events. You know, next season he'll be on the on the board with those clubs for sure. So we'll see a little bit more of him and what he's capable of doing. But for the most part, yeah, I think I think Simashev is one of those players that's going to be one of those sleeper type picks uh, when you when you look at you know players going maybe later in the draft. Yeah, and, and you got to figure, too, that uh, with the Blues having three first-round picks, yes. if they make all three of those picks and he's still on the board and with one of your later picks, that's definitely a name I think you're considering. Another one, Tom Willander, defenseman from Rogel Jr., somebody that people have been talking about with a later pick from Sweden. Uh, lots of greatness coming from him, but any other defenseman that maybe stand out to you that, and again, not, and I think Blues fans need to understand, and most of them do, I think, we're not seeing these guys in the NHL next year no. unless they just no. have a ridiculous camp and it's just, okay, we can't not play this guy. But, you know, you're talking with the Blues, the contracts they have on D, having a couple of these guys pop up in two to three years, that's what you're looking at. Any other defensemen stand out to you? Yeah, th- there are there are two that could drop just because of what I've been talking about with the forwards and, and teams wanting to get in on the forwards quickly. Uh, in the first round, David Reinbacker from, uh, you know, from Austria, uh, Austria born right shot defenseman, 22 points uh, with Clothin in, in, in the National League and in, in, uh, in Switzerland's top division there. Um, and he had uh, five, uh, let's see, two assists in five games for Austria at the 23 uh, World Junior Championships. He's number five on Central Scouting's final list um, of international skaters. He's a right hand shot. Well-rounded defenseman, a good physical presence about him. I thought he had a great World Juniors. He's seldom out of position, plays a mature game, is involved and active, and can uh, play aggressive and tough uh, when needed. And then the other guy who I've been watching closely a a lot, I liked his play at World Juniors. Not sure if he'll be available, but again, you just never know. Axel Sandan Palika uh, of Sweden, the defenseman there, another right shot. He's he's number seven on the final list of international uh, players. Considered one of the most improved prospects in Sweden this season, offensive minded defenseman. He kind of, you know, reminds one a little bit of a Quinn Hughes type, maybe a Ryan Ellis. Real good set, uh, skills, great offensive instincts, uh, has a real hard shot from the point, is a little small, you know, on the, you know, smaller side at 5'11, 176, but he skates real well, knows how to stay out of trouble, uses his stick to gap up really well, plays bigger than than he is and has that real good work ethic that you like to see in these young players. And, uh, you know, I, I think this is a, this is a kid that certainly could go top 25, top 30 in the draft, depending on, of course, how things fall with the forwards from both the North American and the international side. So somebody who might come out of the first round, maybe late or even in the later rounds asking for your sleeper pick here, who's somebody you've got, and maybe it's a couple players you've got your eye on that are like, okay, this kid may not go until the third round, but this kid's going to be in the NHL. 
Yeah, you know, the forward Lenny uh, Hamanahu, uh, I don't know where he's going to fall. I know a lot of teams have liked what they've seen. A lot of scouts and, and general managers that I've spoken to, a right-hand shot, 5'11", 173. He's one of the youngest players uh, in Liga uh, this year, Finland's top professional men's league. I thought he played uh, really well at Asat in, in, in 28 games, plays that mature game, competitive, uh, is active and, and has an excellent work ethic, um, has real smooth hands, is effective in traffic, good at, uh, uh, you know, handling the puck and, 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 you know, in situations that may become a little stressful, uh, plays a, with a lot of confidence, a real confident player, isn't afraid to getting involved and often comes out uh, as a winner in battles along the board. So um, I think Lenny Hamanahu from Finland is a player that you can keep on your radar if you're, if you're a team looking for maybe some type of sleeper down the road. And uh, I don't want to forget uh, Char- uh, Charlie Strimel. Um He played for the United States at the World Juniors, too. He was number 30 um, on uh, the North American side uh, for the final list. So maybe a, a second-round pick, mid-second round, right-handed shot, big size, 6'3", 212, went to the University of Wisconsin this year as a freshman. They struggled, of course. Um, but he kind of regains his confidence a little bit, real big physical presence, um, and, uh, has a great stick, really good on the penalty kill with his stick details. And he's a really good face-off guy too. So he's very, uh, a very versatile player and with the proper development, he can pick up that scoring and do the things that he wanted to do that he couldn't in Wisconsin this year. And, you know, he'll enter Wisconsin his second season and see where it goes from there. But I like what I saw on Stramel and, and he could be a, you know, a nice uh, player to uh, to draft at some point, maybe mid second round. If he doesn't go as high as there, then maybe he'd be a late second, third round pick. I think would be a fine choice. So I've got to ask a uh, final question here for you. Uh, goalie on my panel on my usual uh, live shows will want to know this. Will there be a goalie picked in the first round? There will not be a goalie picked uh, in the first round this year. I just think uh, it, we're too stocked at forward. And then the few defensemen that we mentioned could also go off the board. International side is, is you know, really loaded. So um, the goaltending it has, it is pretty weak on the international side of things. On the North American side, you know, Carson Yarnson from Brandon could be a goalie that's taken maybe mid-second, late-second round. You know, Michael uh, Rabel from, from Omaha, the United States Hockey League, had a fantastic second half of the season. So he's another one that could. And Trey Augustine, who was the starting goalie for the United States at the 23 World Junior Championships, had a great season at the, uh, the USA Hockey's National Team Development Program under-18 team. So another goalie there that could, uh, that could go off the board maybe mid-second, uh, third round as well. So no goalies this year, Jeff, uh, going in the first round from what I see. Sorry, Bill. It's unfortunate for you, buddy. Uh, Mike, right. always a pleasure having you on the show. Please, before we let you go, let our listeners know how they can find you on social media, where they can find all of your work, and how they can and and what to expect from the NHL Draft Class podcast over at NHL.com. Well, fans can uh, catch me on Twitter at, at Mike Moriel NHL. Um, I have plenty of content on NHL.com right now. As you mentioned earlier, Jeff, I do a lot of the Devils work, so. I'm in the midst of that Devils Hurricane series right now, which is a thrill a minute. Uh, both teams winning uh, their home games, so we'll see what the Devils can do and kind of rebound here to, to even or maybe even win this series. So that's been a lot of fun. Um, and then as far as the draft goes, I'll maintain and continue the draft coverage. Uh, we'll have prospect profiles on a lot of the players that we mentioned here today. Um, and then the NHL Draft Class uh, podcast uh, with co-host Adam Kimmelman. Uh, we'll be starting to ramp up the shows maybe once once a week, once every two weeks. And then, you know, that month leading up to the draft, we'll have a show once a week with with some of the uh, some of the scouts from Central Scouting uh, talking about the players in their particular regions. Um, and, and and of course, it, it's always a fun time when we're able to discuss, you know, uh, some of those up and coming prospects that are in development camps and and what they're you know capable of doing for their respective teams, for their organizations that could be playing on the teams in the real near future. So it's always a, it's always a fun uh, fun time on the NHL Draft Class podcast. So fans can catch that on any one of their uh, their favorite uh, podcast platforms, uh, Apple and Spotify, and 
we're all over the, you know, as far as uh, that goes uh, with, with catching us there. So all good stuff, awesome. Jeff. Well, thanks again to Mike for coming on the show. It was a very late notice thing too. I messaged him, I believe it was Monday night. And I just was like, Hey, you know, I know this is last minute. We'd love to get you on this week. If you can, he made time for me. Uh, we did it. Uh, we recorded on Tuesday. Um, just a quick turnaround. And these guys know that a lot of this stuff, you know, it's like, Hey, we need you very quickly. Um, you know, with the news of where the blues are picking, but still, um, it's, it's very, I, I appreciate when these guys can step in last minute and be a guest on a show like ours. It's just so great. Hockey community can't say enough about it. Um, everybody's willing to help each other out and it's, it's, uh, it's great. Um, I, I just really appreciate that kind of stuff. Plus, it's a he's a cool dude. You know, we sat and, and rapped. You all heard, uh, you know, us talk about our experiences. So um, just always good having good people on the show. Uh, so next week, folks, we'll have our first all time team reveal. I uh, don't know who will be joining me yet. Uh, but remember, we've got that panel of 11 people. Uh, so we will be having at least one person uh, coming on. I don't know if it's somebody from Let's Go Blues Radio or, or otherwise um, to talk about who is the, well, the three best left-handed defensemen of all time picked by you, the fans. Uh, could it, is, it, is Chris Pronger making the cut? Is Barrett Jackman, Noel Picard, Jay Bomeister, Carl Gunnarsson, Al Arbor, uh, Paul Cavallini? I mean, we... we went through these the blues all time and and made these selections so who makes the cut there's some really good picks out there we will see make sure you turn in tune in next week to find out what left-handed defensemen make the blues all-time team at least according to let's go blues radio and its listeners uh well that'll do it for this week's show support for let's go blues radio is brought to you in part by rocking that id life.com where spring cleaning isn't just for your home, let's clean up your health together. Visit rockinthatidlife.com for more information. That's rockinthatidlife.com. And get 10% off by emailing Dustin at rockinthatidlife at gmail.com and tell him Let's Go Blues Radio sent you. And by Mike Burgoyne from Real Brokerage Realty. Visit strikewithmike.com today for all of your home buying and selling needs. That's strikewithmike.com. And by Center Ice Brewery, St. Louis's tasty hockey-themed beer. Check out centericebrewery.com and navigate to their Where to Find Us page for availability. That's Center Ice Brewery beer. Please drink responsibly. That'll do it for Episode 3 of Season 12 of the original St. Louis Blues Hockey Podcast, Let's Go Blues Radio. Thank you so much for tuning in, and have a great week, everyone. For Kurt Price, Bill Day, and Producer Austin, I'm Jeff Ponder, and I'll talk with you next week. This was Let's Go Blues Radio. Until next time, everyone, let's go blues. Sit, Ubu, sit. Good dog. <laughs> you thought I was going to say, son of a bitch, didn't you? <laughs>